From the Toronto Star, I'm Evie Kwong, and this matters. Today, we speak with Dr. Homer Tien, the new head of Ontario's Vaccine Task Force. He's served 25 years on the battlefield as a trauma surgeon with the Canadian Forces. He's also done time as a trauma surgeon at Sunnybrook Hospital and is now the CEO of Orange Air Ambulance. We get into the details on the confusion around Ontario's vaccine rollout, the province's supply and where vaccines are going, and how communication, as he says, could always be better. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Hermutian, and it's really happy that you're able to see us and also lay ho and also hope that we can have this discussion. Uh, so just as I was saying before, your start as a head of the Ontario Vaccine Task Force. Walk me through a little bit of the process and how you got to be there. When did you agree to take this position, you know, after Hillier left in March? Sure. The uh, I'll sort of take it back to, uh, so I was, a, I think the Vaccine Task Force itself as a member I was asked to be on the vaccine task force uh, sometime in early December, I think the 4th or the 5th, I can't remember the exact date. And I think the reason I was on the task force is because I'm the CEO of Orange, the Air Ambulance Service, and there was a recognition that there was going to be a need to do the vaccination uh, for for some of these remote uh, Indigenous communities. And so I was asked to take to take the lead on that in um I guess around the Christmas time period. So I was the operational lead for what we called Operation Remote Immunity for the remote Indigenous flying communities. So that was that started wrapping up uh, in sort of the end of March, and I think uh, people were happy with how that operation had unfolded. And so I can't remember the exact date, but sometime around the end of March, they were saying, "Well, because." General Hillier is leaving, would you uh, consider doing uh, becoming the task force lead? And my, you know, so it happened actually quite late. So I'm going to say it's um, the late March time period, like maybe the beginning of April, where we actually settled that I would do it. And, uh, you know, it's one of these things where I was actually quite looking forward to the end of operational remote immunity, because that was actually a very, very busy time and just focusing on orange. But it's one of those things where when asked to do something like that, it's hard to say no, uh, because it's an important job. And so in the end, of course, uh, happy to help. And uh, so I, I did say yes. And I think that explains a lot about what you've done before. You know, you did 25 years with the Canadian Forces. You also were, at, you know, a surgeon at Sunnybrook at the top level. And now you're at Orange. And in Ontario, I'm going to say the feeling is really bleak among a lot of people because of the communication, because of other things. You know, just talking about how many ICU transfers there have been just between April 1st to 18th, 498 people have been transferred whether that's from more remote places into more you know, local areas like Ottawa, Toronto, to get that care into ICUs. And that's already double the amount in the month of basically March and February and also January. And so what does this show about our control over COVID-19 at this moment with the variants of concern, obviously, you know, hitting numbers we've never seen before and the situations in hospital ICUs? Like, what does that all say about how many people are being transferred at this moment? I think the number of patients being transferred is quite substantial, as you point out, and I don't have the exact number at my fingertips, but I think a couple of things have happened. And the um, obviously, the new variants, uh, they're more infectious, so they're, they are more infectious. I think people are getting tired of the public health measures, and obviously, there's a disproportionate effect on people who live in crowded socioeconomic circumstances. So I think it's sort of the the combination of all three of these things that are basically hitting us at the same time. The and and not to say this is good news, but I think the the vaccination program under General Hilliard had actually hit a lot of the elderly patients. So the eighty, like if you look at the eighty plus, the seventy five plus, and so forth, the ones with the highest risk of dying they're essentially vaccinated. And so we're not seeing the same uh, incidence of, of COVID in these groups. And so that's why you're seeing it disproportionately affecting the younger people. But that's mostly because the older people are already protected and they're not uh, dying, thank goodness, from that. But what we are seeing, 
because of the high infectivity of the uh, of the variants is that the numbers are quite high, especially in these high risk uh, neighborhoods, and that um, that obviously that because you have high numbers of people being infected, it's affecting our ICUs and our hospitals much more acutely. I would just like to ask, basically, you were told at the end of March, which is basically Hillier's last days, that you would be trying to lead this. And obviously, at that point, I think the vaccine rollout had already lagged a little bit in the way that people in Ontario have seen it, right? So the age, of course, is the biggest factor. And I think that for a long time was what the priority was, which I'm not definitely saying is not wrong, but I feel there was a sudden pivot to postal codes. And is that one of the first things that you implemented? And why did it take so long to get to that place? So, and uh, I guess I'll give you, if you look at the original plan that uh, I think General Hillier and, and group had decided upon, the there's a phase one and a phase two. So the phase one actually coincided with his, his departure and phase two was in April. And the phase two, there's a it's it's not so much a pivot, but it was there were certain age groups that the various high risk age groups would be finished at that point. And then in April, there'd be a focus on what they call high risk conditions, the highest risk conditions and the high risk neighborhoods. And so it was actually fortuitous. One of the first things I, I had, uh, I guess, did when I started was I was able to talk to the science table because there's their colleagues of mine, obviously, at the University of Toronto. And I did have some conversation about some of the new modeling work that was coming out. And so not so much as a pivot, but, you know, the timing was fortuitous in that their modeling was coming out about the need for high risk FSAs. So the forward sortation areas and the fact that we were into phase two, we just started with phase two from a timing and there should be a focus now on high risk uh, areas. And so uh, what we talked about with uh, both the government and the and the um, the ministries of health and solicitor general was because of this information we should think about um, focusing like there's still an age based criteria but with some extra attention on the high risk areas to try to get that under control and so it was a a bit about the timing but also a bit about that uh, they were they just released some of their modeling data coincident and I had the opportunity to speak with them right at the beginning. So one of the first things, I mean, because Eula had said it was sort of fortuitous that you come into basically the modeling, the phase two of it, and basically be able to shift to the essential workers and these postal codes. Was that a way basically using the postal codes to kind of figure out these are mostly where the essential workers live and this would help the most or like the low income or the people that live, you know, multi-generational homes. Is that why the postal code thing came about? Was that always in the plans, you know, from the beginning, even when Hillier was there? I don't know if it was in the plans by postal codes, but the way that their modeling is presented is by postal codes. It's by the first three, the first letters and digits of the postal code. So all of their socioeconomic data on what's high risk is defined by that. And so uh, to use their model to its fullest effect, it sort of makes sense to use how they did their, how they sorted out their data. And so that, so we use the data that they provided in terms of these are the high risk neighborhoods. I think to be honest, there has been a communication problem with these vaccines. When that announcement, what happened, the 18 plus announcements, and I know a lot of younger people and also people in general in those hotspots were like, okay, so it's gonna be done by the end of the week, right? Do you think that that was a bit premature to say because it felt like a lot of people were checking and checking, refreshing, it was kind of like, a crazy concert or even something like a line that's being like, can I get that spot? It seemed like the announcement came way too soon and it left a lot of even some officials in these municipalities like a little bit scrambling. They're like, we don't really know how this is going to come together. And so I think it's really brought that to light. So in your opinion, do you think that it was too soon to announce something like that for a population that's clearly really desperate to get this figured out? Communication can always, always be better. And so I think, you know, for people who... You know, when we communicate something and people uh, are confused with what our intent is, I mean, that we should we always are apologetic of that because communication can always be better. There is a bit of an operational and and time essence, though, and so I would I would point out that if you looked at um, Dr. Brown's data from April the twelfth, although the modeling was quite dire. What we were able to do, if you look at his data, you know, there's this plot of green and red by neighborhoods. 
if you look at the age groups from 50 to 74 in the highest risk neighborhoods, that imbalance is now corrected somewhat, right? Because the whole premise of his analysis was that the lowest risk neighborhoods were actually getting way more vaccinations than the highest risk. And so in that switch and in the confusion of how that came out, and again, communication could always be better, but in those days where people, you know, 50 and above were going to in the high risk areas to get their vaccinations, we were able to turn the the proportion of people vaccinated in high risk areas. So in the ages of 50 to, and I think it's 70, but I, I'd have to look at the exact chart. They're now actually more vaccinated. They have a higher vaccination rate than the people in the the least risk neighborhoods, which was not true two weeks prior to that. And so I think there's always a trade-off between operational efficiency, so changing the narrative on their risk and the communication. And communication can always be better. I, I fully agree with that. I want to just add more that a lot of people have been using that vaccine hunters Twitter, which is run by, you know, four full time. They have their own jobs. And I think it's been a lot for them. And they obviously have a passion to consolidate a singular place for all these vaccines. You know, people here really want that clear communication. It seems strange that the only place for people to really find one singular part of information is on that vaccine hunters website, which has nothing to do with the Ontario government, it's its own thing. What do you think about that? And also, are there going to be plans to make this in a singular, more clear place, like a one website, a one thing? Because I think the main thing that we're hearing from a lot of people and not even politically minded, just people just being like, where do I go? And I think you're right. I mean, I think some of this is um, historic in, in the sense that when it was first set up, there's limitations to the provincial booking system. And then there were different... Um, uh, I guess, ways of booking. Uh, so for these mass vaccination and hospital vaccination systems, I think from a, you know, from a planning point in, in December, when, when people were conceiving this, though, if you're thinking that you're about to launch a booking system, there's some benefits of having some redundancy in your, in your system. So that if for whatever reason, if the larger system uh, has some issues, at least you have a redundant system that's based at the hospital level or at the public health unit. I think you're right. The trend has been that we're slowly migrating towards a provincial system, but uh, that is a bit of a process and they continue, like the PHUs continue to migrate over, but there is a sense that, well, if there is an issue, the redundancy does give a bit of flexibility. So that's on the provincial system versus some of the public health. There's a separate channel, obviously, through pharmacy. And pharmacy represents a separate challenge and a separate channel for getting vaccines. And so that's a little more difficult for us to have that on a provincial system. So again, it's sort of the trade-off between there's many advantages for having multiple channels for getting vaccination. And then if you have to trade off you know, a little more confusion on the booking, but you have all these different ways of penetrating some of these hard to reach neighborhoods. There is some advantage for having the pharmacy system independent and uh, because, you know, they are a private company or enterprise that it's harder for us to have them on our, on our booking system because we don't have all the, uh, like the information and inputs coming from the pharmacy but having a separate system, but it's still a very powerful channel for administering uh, vaccines at the community level. So it is a bit of a trade-off. Knowing that a lot of the people are, that are getting hit are immigrants and low-income, racialized people, I just think back to my Chinese family. I don't know how they're going to get information like that. What else needs to be done to get to these certain groups? Because they only have one source and maybe that's Fairchild, maybe it's one thing, but they might, Fairchild themselves might not even get that. And I'm just doing that as a singular experience of a greater issue that's out there right now. So do you think it needs to be more clear and need, more needs to be done right now? Absolutely. And, and you know, the, the uh, I guess your example of say um, for for um, new immigrants uh, and, and that your, your experience there obviously resonates with me as well in terms of you know, if my parents, uh, you know, who don't speak English so well and they, uh, they're they not as savvy with technology, how do they get this information? I think one of the things that we're doing 
now is we're, we're, we're partnering with community groups in the high risk neighborhoods, like so places of worship, community centers, and we're sending mobile teams out. And so that level of communication is more at the community level. So a community leader would say, call up someone's parents or someone's aunts and uncles to say, hey, there's a pop-up clinic that's going to happen at this location within this date. And these are much more community-led initiatives at the public health unit and even at a, at a more community-based level. We're, we're focusing on those uh, in the high-risk areas as one strategy to reach out to, to uh, people who, who might be missed otherwise. Plus, we're obviously still doing the mass vaccination clinics because those those are the fastest way to immunize, but they, they miss out, they lose out a bit in equity. And so from the equity point of view, we need to be active in reaching out to people. The Jane and Finch pop-up at Tobermory, which is at the basketball court, is an example of a mobile clinic, you know, pop-up clinic, I would say, that just happened there. And there were people waiting in line for hours. And it's great to see because I know the discourse has been a lot around vaccine hesitancy with racialized people, but that's definitely not only the case. There's a lot of white populations that face vaccine hesitancy, whether or not it's portrayed in the same way is something that I feel like we still have to discuss when we talk about, you know, the anti mass protests that go down the street or whatever. But more so with these mobile clinics. So what is happening with the mobile clinics and what is the plan moving forward? So I, I think and. Maybe I'll explain one point to you. So the as much as I'd like to take credit for all of the mobile clinics, because I think they're doing wonderful work, the mobile clinics tend to be like they, they're the work of the public health units and the local health officials who, who recognize that there's an area of need and uh, they work towards that. And they, uh, they take some of their al- allocated uh, vaccine and then they arrange the resources to go at the, at the provincial level. What we, we've said is we, we want to encourage this. Um, and so uh, we've had lots of discussion about the importance of doing pop-up clinics. We've created some resources that, um, that certain public health units might access. So, for example, we put some nurses on contract so that we can send them. We have some planners that can help. And so there's different public health units with different uh, resources, and they may be busy managing um, outbreaks. And so what we're offering is also if they need the help, we will offer we'll offer services in terms of uh, human health resources and planners to help them with these pop-up clinics. If they have lots of resources and they just are happy to go on, then we're, we're happy with that as well. So we're working very closely with the public health partners, but the operational people at sort of the you know, the pointy end of the spear, so to speak, are actually the public health units and the hospitals where they work together to to make one of these public uh, one of these pop up clinics. There have been a lot of tweets from, you know, experts out there that are saying that we're holding on to a lot of vaccines and freezers. What is happening with the whole supply issue? Just understanding where some places are being like, we don't have enough. And others are saying, well, there's some freezers. What's really going on there? Sure. that And that's such a great question. And it might take me a couple of minutes to sort of explain this, but uh, so I think there's two aspects. So in a place like Toronto, when you think, when you, first of all, if you think about just the amount of healthcare personnel and healthcare capacity we have in Toronto and everyone is wanting to do their part, we have a lot of people, my colleagues at like Sunnybrook included, who put up their hand and say, I volunteer, I want to give vaccines. And I want to help out with administration. So we have way more capacity to, in terms of uh, the ability to give needles than we have actual vaccines. And so if, uh, if, if, we, if people are booking clinics based on sheer availability of, of human health resources to give vaccines and do administration, we, we don't nearly have enough vaccine. And so then that's one scenario. And then if they're planning based on an allocation that we think, right? So say, you know, we've got a report now that we're going to get 600,000 vaccines next week. And so then justifiably, they book that amount of human health resource to meet that. And then we have a cut in the vaccine uh, to 400,000 then there will be a shortage, right? So then they'll have to cancel appointments. 
So then that's, so there have been changes a lot in our allocation. The last question about vaccine in freezers, there, there are no vaccines in freezers. So what happens is when the ministry gets vaccine, we, we actually weeks before we have meetings with and allocation meetings with the public health units. And then we plan on that. We say, here's how much Pfizer you get. Here's how much Moderna you get. And here's how much, and less so AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca is mostly for the pharmacy and primary health units. So then what actually happens is they plan their clinics based on that. Now, because Pfizer is very regular, it, it's a very reliable, the same amount shows up every week. They plan their clinics based on that allotment of Pfizer. And by the end of the week, right before the next shipment, they have almost run down. No one wants to run to zero because that puts them in a very vulnerable position. And so, but they're almost to zero and then they get replenished and then they continue on. Moderna is a little more complicated because if you've seen in the news, it gets, it's much more infrequent and it's much more, uh, the, the doses get cut back all the time. And so people tend not to book their clinics on Moderna until they actually see it in their hand and they book it a little more conservatively because Moderna is a little easier to use than Pfizer. So people prefer it for things like pop-up clinics and so forth, but they're a little more conservative in how they use it. And so, for example, when we were doing the North, we only use Moderna because of its ease for use, but you have to be much more because of the, um, changes in the scheduling, we were always sort of nervous that, oh, this clinic, like we booked all these aircraft to go to this uh, First Nations communities, are we going to be able to do it? So you had to be more conservative in your booking. AstraZeneca is a special case because it's going through the pharmacy chain. But as you know of the limitations, the 50, it was only good for 55 plus, and it suffered from a major image issue. It's actually an extremely good a vaccine. It's basically helped the UK sort of get out of their, you know, their major third wave, but it suffers a publicity issue. So what's ha one of the things we've been working hard, hard on is to try to drop that age range. So you probably heard that AstraZeneca dropped from 55 to 40. So it's been with the pharmacies and people haven't been using it. Like the uptake has been low in pharmacies. It's not that it's sitting in a fridge. It's just that people haven't been opting for it as much. But now, like just based on today, the uptake is way better because now it's not just 55 to 60, it's 40 to 55. So that's probably the biggest thing that will help us completely use up our AstraZeneca. But our problem will be that we'll use it up and then we won't have anything to refill it. And so um, that, that's our issue. But there are no, there's no provincial fridge where vaccine is sitting because there, there'd be no benefit for us to do that at all. Our, our plan has always been get it out to people, get it into arms, but particularly the high-risk um, areas. We'll be right back. I just want to bring in the human element just now because I think like you have just said, I've seen some really damaging, you know, image issues with AstraZeneca and it's really a hard thing, you know, the uptake and hopefully lowering the age and getting it out there more will get more people taking it. And also it's on that person and those people to be like, I feel fine after this. And that's really what's helped people get rid of their hesitancy. Do you think at the beginning, like we're just going to talk straight from the beginning, maybe in like May 2020, should there have been as comprehensive of a plan to tackle vaccine hesitancy that right now we're really trying to chase or even give keywords or I don't even know, like words for people to understand stuff like efficacy, stuff like all that stuff. Because right now it seems like to be a really big jumble to just the everyday person. And so like, especially also in the communities we've spoken to, I'll speak to my own. A lot of them had said this was a waiting period for them to get Pfizer. You know, they're all 55 plus, but like a lot of the Chinese community is like, I'm waiting for the Porsche of vaccines. And so there needs to be a more education on the human level because you can get the vaccines out there, which is great and hopefully it's moving and hopefully more people are getting it but it's about getting into the arms and the approval of the people so do you think we should have started that education a lot longer ago because it seems like that's one of the biggest barriers with the AstraZeneca right now I agree the 
And I think if you sort of look at the history of vaccine hesitancy, it, it well predates um, COVID, right? I mean, there's a, a obviously influenza, like all of the vaccines, there's a significant increase in anti-vaxxers. And so there can't be enough education on that um, and because we, we have a real problem with that. I think part of it, though, is the... the um, I, I guess it's the it's the reporting around the the clot issue around the AstraZeneca has really focused on sort of these few cases where you know probably if you work out the per million it's less than the risk of clotting for birth control but it's really played on people's mind because it's received a disproportionate amount of attention right in in media and people are looking at that. And so it's actually hard to combat that. And then I agree with you. Like my parents were like, oh, AstraZeneca, like what's happening with all this stuff on that? And um, at some point it's hard to, uh, and we continue to educate and we have leaders doing that. And you'll see that, you know, the political leaders are going and getting their AstraZeneca shot because they want to instill confidence in that. And I think the more that community leaders do that and show the confidence in it, that's very helpful. Um, but it, it is a problem with the uh, with the reports of the clotting in the media. Like that's that's I think creating that. I mean, you have to report the truth, and that is the truth. There is a rate of clotting for AstraZeneca, but just to put it in perspective, right? There's a risk of clotting with birth control, and that's actually it's it's higher than that. So it's all proportionate. So we talked about Operation Remote Immunity, which you already on Ontario's vaccine table were you were already working on. And that's something that you helped lead, you know, even before this in 2019, even before you had said a big passion of yours was getting emergency resources out to more remote places. And especially with the First Nation and Indigenous community, they have obviously a history of, you know, forced sterilizations. That's just something that's happened. And so we did see a lot of success with this. And I spoke with Dr. Lisa Richardson, which is one of the many who led these vaccine clinics. And there they were talking about how, you know, there's elders there. They smudge the vials before they start. It has a lot of cultural sensitivity, which I do think attributes to the success of it. If a participant or a recipient was supposed to be there and they got second thoughts, there were people all around to be like, it's okay. And like, you know, talk them through it or they could return the next day. So what was the success behind this rollout? What are major takeaways of why this worked so well? There's two major ones, and I'll, I'll speak to them in the order that I, I guess you've been chatting about, or I want that one of them is the community involvement. And I think this is the model that we're trying to bring to the pop-up clinics, which is the idea that um, when you get the community excited, then you you reach the most people. And then there truly is a sense of community engagement. The 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 we we actually identified a community leader uh, who was responsible for setting up the clinic um, for that community. We arranged for funding through FNIB so that that person, because it was a full time work for that person, uh, plus their helpers and so forth. So that person was full time arranging this in liaison with our team. We uh, had multiple conference calls with the chiefs and the band leaders. And, and their healthcare staff. So I think it's that level of engagement of the community that makes it successful. But the, the other major reason why it was successful is probably less well known is in, in the midst of a sort of the vaccine shortage, they guaranteed my supply. And so because we, we basically had a very tight schedule of you know, this airplane with these amount of people, like with Dr. Richardson, we're going to go to Sandy Lake or whatever community uh, on this date. If there was a supply issue, that would have been catastrophic for us because the community had already been mobilized and ready to go. And so the, um, like the planners from the vaccine task force were actually very good about saying, okay, we're going to make sure that you get your supply. And so that that in itself was huge in garnering the support and the trust of the community because nothing would have been worse to get them all ready to go and then not show up with the, with the vaccine. And so as a small sort of microcosm, that's why it was successful. Community engagement 
and a, a steady supply of vaccine. So that's something if we blow it up in what the next task is, is to bring it to the rest of the hotspots in Ontario. It is going to be culturally different, of course, because, you know, it's it's even hard to think about how different each community, and that includes, you know, the white community that may have the anti-vaxxer conspiracy theory thing going on. What are the plans to like kind of take that model and move it to like that was so successful. We'd love to see that in all these hotspot communities. Right. How is that going to happen? Is there going to be the same guarantee of supply? Because like you said, in the second point, that was why it worked. You know, you're not just going to send a plane full of people, doctors, resources out, not knowing that you would have enough and all these people show up like to reject a single person from there would be terrible, like awful. Is that something like more secure that we can somehow manage and organize or is it really just reliant continued on these outside you know supplies that we can't really manage like how can we say okay jane and finch you're gonna have this much and brampton you're gonna have this much and that's gonna be a for sure thing what can the province do then to get it to be as successful i guess when you think about the rest of the province and the amount of people uh who need vaccine i think basically we have a gross imbalance of demand for supply And so I think there's no easy way around that, right? So I think in in the May June timeframe, there's been some promise of larger shipments of Pfizer with more regular uh, with the same regularity as they have now. So, but maybe uh, significantly more. Where we've been having trouble, obviously, has been with the uh, Moderna and the um, and the AstraZeneca. Those are the ones that are the easiest to use in the mobile setting, right? Because they don't have the as stringent um, uh, logistical challenges for for cooling and so forth, and so I think we've sort of suffered from from that. And I guess the, you know we we can only trade off in one of two ways. One is plan to do very small clinics based on guaranteed supply, but that just means that um, at some point, sometimes we will have more. Uh, vaccine and freezers for a shorter period for a short period of time because we're waiting to make sure that we have it and then we're booking conservatively if you book to try to get as many done as as we can and there's a there's an advantage and outcome for that right the more people immunize the better over a short period of time we'll run into times where we uh, there's more uh, demand than supply and then we run out with the with the problems of people being very unhappy because they were all set with the expectation of getting their vaccine and then not receiving it. So I think really our issue is a supply issue. If we had a regular supply, giving vaccines and planning these community outreaches isn't that that difficult because we've got so many very smart uh, you know, physicians, nurses, community members at all of the public health units around Ontario that are willing to do this work and are very keen to do it. Um, you just can't seem to guarantee them, uh, and I apologize, that's my dog, but uh, uh, we don't have a guaranteed supply of vaccine that that can enable us to do that, unlike ORI, which the, which the province guaranteed me to have that. Because of that guarantee, the communication was also a lot easier. You know, you could go to, and I think that's also another issue on top of supply, right? Just because like what we've discussed, we're just going to take the everyday person who's been refreshing every day and trying to get it done. And one thing I also want to bring up is in communities like Jane and Finch and Brampton, it's no wonder and it's not a surprise that there's high infection rates because a lot of the jobs are in areas that have, you know, a lot of the COVID-19 outbreaks, factories, construction work, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's really important right now, obviously all the experts are pointing to paid sick leave as something as for all the legislation. So it ensures that they have the comfortability to take time off. And just knowing that CRSB is different, you know, there are things that are different about it. You would have to miss 50% of your work week. You would have the pay is retroactive. And so there are different points of it. And I just point to the fact that, you know, a lot of the people that went to the Jane and Finch pop-up this weekend, they could only do it this weekend because they work five days a week, you know, and hours that are in these factories for a long time, lifting heavy objects. And then, you know, I was speaking to someone who was there with her family who basically said, yeah, they lift very heavy things. And I've heard people, you know, they might have an arm soreness the next day. That's something that a vaccine might happen, right? That's a small thing. We're not even talking about people who might feel feverish just because that's just a side effect for some people. It depends on who they are. Wouldn't paid sick leave just help 
just those extra one or two days off, making sure that they can still provide and put money on the table, pay rent, all those kind of things. Be something that's helpful for someone who's just like, look, I have to go to the factory tomorrow. I just got vaccinated on Sunday. I'm afraid it's going to hurt more if I lift heavy things. But that's been something that experts have been saying over and over and over again. So I just want to know that whole idea of paid sick leave. What's your take on that? You're right. Like it's accessibility for vaccine is an issue, right? And that's the whole idea when you're in a lower socioeconomic area. That's uh, those are extra barriers than if you're living in the uh, you know the Lawrence Park area, the Rosedale area. You can just take time off. I think what we need to do is make it as accessible as possible for people, regardless of socioeconomic class. So that can be um, pop-ups at work, right? So vaccinations at work that can be vaccinations in their community, places of worship, and all of that. I think it really ends up being we have to make it as accessible as possible. I mean, ORI, we went to the community because another approach might have been just doing it in places like Sioux Lookout, but that that would guarantee that you'd have very minimal uptake. So we have to make it as easy as possible for people to get their vaccines, particularly when the social determinants of health make it very difficult for them to get vaccine. And because they're probably at slightly increased risk of transmission because they're living in uh, crowded housing. Uh, more so than other areas. Yeah, and a lot of them are in multi-generational housing. So that's like grandma. I grew up like that too. So it's just like, I, I totally see that and how it's difficult, especially with, you know, literacy of how to book English and internet literacy is essential in some ways. And I guess the pop-up at Jane and Finch was a first come first serve, which is why it was a little bit different. You could just show up and they were able to in those hours. But even talking about like, making it accessible like how is it going to happen for all these communities like so you said places of worship what other locations are there that could be targeted more and the province could work with these public health units to be like hey this is how we're going to do it because like i don't know if there's any other way other than experts saying paid sick leave is something that guarantees people not to fear that they're going to lose pay and not to fear that they're going to not be able to pay rent or you know buy dinner that night or go further into debt or whatever it may be and they have so many people to provide for while If they're feeling sick, like if they're feeling like they need to get tested, they would choose to go to work sick and not get tested. And I think that's a really real reality. So in terms of making things more accessible, like where would these pop ups be and more so on that ask for the experts on paid sick leave? I think one of the places that we uh, and we're working with Toronto and Peel about where uh, there's a Hindu uh, temple at called Babs Temple and sort of at the border of Peel and um, in sort of uh, Rexdale area. And so we're actually in the midst of running a pop-up clinic there uh, for, you know, the, the congregation there, but also for the surrounding neighborhood. And one of the things that we found was that um, it's very easy to book. Like we, we, alloc- we, we planned for about 15,000 to be done there, and but with a slow ramp up just to work out the bugs. And I think it's, Within days, I think about 98% were booked. And so very, very uh, successful from a booking. But what we noticed was that, and we're trying to work out the numbers, is that we've gone through the age bands already, right? So theoretically, there should be fewer 80-year-olds or 70-year-olds that should be booking. They should be, because they've already had their opportunity to book. But we are noticing that there are 80-year-olds and 70-year-olds that are booking at the at the temple for for the pop up, and so that suggests that it's reaching a group that that haven't otherwise been either reached or convinced to get their vaccination. And I think these places of worship and more of these community pop ups that come up will, will be one major way of of going into uh, getting the heart to reach people. I think places of work we're having conversations with different companies where. Uh, you know, there's certain criteria that we're going to use to evaluate them, uh, but they have to be obviously in a high risk area. They have to, but they have to be willing to act as a neighborhood hub as well. So they have to be willing to vaccinate some of the people in the area as well. And they have to, uh, they have to provide the, the human health resources to do the vaccination. So there's a bit of, of humanitarianism in the gesture as well. And there's a lot of interest in that. So this is an opportunity to vaccinate workers and the surrounding neighborhood for people who are hard to reach as well. And I think 
these are some different strategies that are actively in motion now to reach some of these hard to reach areas. And I'm sure it's a challenge, but getting these employers to sign on to this, because I believe that they are the ones who have to fund this clinic and the vaccine clinic at the workplace. They're putting their hands up. We're actually, uh, it's a bit of an issue to try to manage all the number of people who put their hand up to, to try to go through them. And so as somebody who is on the task force for getting these vaccines out, what do you think is the biggest challenges ahead of you? Like, let's just name three right now. So we're getting to the workplaces I mean, I'm not going to say for you the three biggest challenges at this moment right now for you guys to figure out in a fast, in a quick, quick turnaround kind of way. We're in the middle of a third wave. So everything that we're doing and planning is in that context of the third wave and the sort of diminishing ICU capacity. So there's a sense of urgency to every everything that we plan for and do. And then that's in the context of at least this month of very questionable supply. So that just sort of increases the pressure on everybody in the sense that we have this burning need to get these vaccines out, particularly in the high speed in, into the high risk areas. But in the context of, oh, guess what? This vaccine allocation that you've been planning on and all the PHEs have been planning on has just been cut. So I think in the short term, those are like in the next two to three weeks, those are the ma- that's the major challenge that we face. The, the pressure to get stuff out in, while we have a, a slightly unstable supply. Going into May, I think uh, as the Pfizer uh, doses become hopefully ramped up and remain steady, I think that problem will diminish. And then, then we start getting into hopefully larger numbers. And then uh, that issue will will subside. But then there will be some issues about planning for second doses for people and uh, how we're going to do that. And then as we look even a little further, what happens with children and so forth. And that's further down the road. And before we go into the concluding thoughts, my last question in this segment really is, why do you think there is so much resistance for the province to implement something like legislated paid sick leave? You know what? I really can't tell you. Like, whether or not there's resistance or not, I, I can't really tell you because I'm not uh, privy to those conversations. Okay. And so also you have someone, like I've said, have worked in the Canadian forces or all around the world. Now you're at Orange. This is probably almost a record number of people you've had to transfer personally. How does this weigh on you? You know, you've seen a lot of this, you know, you've seen tons of this t- type of stuff. So much history of what you've done is about seeing people in like the hardest situations this new war that we're waging, really, how does it feel personally, seeing those numbers? Yeah, you know, it weighs quite heavily, I'll, I'll tell you, because the, um, and, and not to say that uh, there's a slightly different perspective when you're overseas versus when you're at home in your own backyard, right? Because, it, you know, as a surgeon or as a uh, clinician, there's always slight, there's a slight depersonalization in the work that you do, right? So when uh, when someone comes in and it's a, you know, we have to do war surgery on them, you, you can't really continue doing that if you personalize every case. Uh, same thing with trauma surgery. Um, I think, though, that every day when we look at the province, right, these are, this is our community that we see in crisis. And so, uh, the, you know, and the, these are my colleagues that I hear on the, on TV, on, um, uh, on the phone saying that they're stressed, that they're, uh, you know, they're impacted by some of the tough decisions that they have to make. So I think there's a level of personalization that gets hard to take because you feel bad about what you see and what you hear uh, on TV, on the phone and so forth. And I think part of it, all, and I think everyone is suffering from this, right? Because all the healthcare workers, we see it, we hear it, it's everywhere. And it's the duration. It'd be one thing if it was just two weeks or, or something, but there is a sense that this, we're now almost a year and a bit, a year and a half into it. And it's like, geez, it's, it's, still, it's still happening. And so it, it, there really is a sense that you have to turn your mindset into this is just, it's a marathon. We just got to keep going one more, you know, one more kilometer, one more step or that much closer. But it's a bit of a mind trick because you don't quite see the end. Right. So 
you keep running with the idea that we're closer, but we don't know where the end is yet. And to be honest, when you took over this role, a lot of the doctors that do street care that have worked with you, they were really encouraged to see that, you know, you could have the lens that understands systemic racism and how it does affect the social determinants of health and everything like that. And you've seen a lot of that, too. Do you think yourself, like in terms of the people that are being hit hardest, that it's not just the healthcare system, but it's a lot of other things that really have been brought out through this pandemic that hurt a lot of racialized, low income people? I mean, to be honest, I think everyone at the ministry or at the government is actually quite sensitized to it because I think, you know, the science table has been very good about, you know, doing that type of analysis and they're invited to present to us on a frequent basis. And I certainly know that that was a regular basis before I took over as chair, but certainly it continues. And I think the way they do their analysis and they really focus on some of the inequities. I mean, I I, I know that because I was up in the North and, and that, but the government is aware of that because they prioritized my operation in the North for vaccine. So they there is a recognition that there are inequities that have to be managed by how we distribute vaccine, as I mentioned, or I was only successful because they ring fenced that vaccine for me. So and that wasn't my decision, that was my ask, but they someone had to agree on that uh, with authority. And so that person who represents, I guess, the ministry and the government recognizes that there's some health inequities about access to care and that that have to be corrected by some of the vaccination programs. And I think when you talk to some of the First Nations leaders, I think they recognize that that uh, that, that had been done as well. What is your message for just the average Ontarian right now? You know, they're terrified every day they watch the numbers. I think we all do that. And I think, like you said, it, if we could see an end in sight, that would be something that it might seem like we're at the final boss or at the final situation where we can finally overcome it. But what would you see for some people that are seeing more people in ICUs and the healthcare heroes and also just the average person? Like, what should they do? What can they do right now? I mean, I think there's there's a message of what we should do and then a message of hope. And I think the message of what we should do is we need to adhere to the public health measures. I think everyone has been saying that it's not vaccine that gets us out of the third wave. It's the public health measures of don't congregate, don't uh, leave your home unless necessary, social distancing, mask wearing. It's that level of of public health measures that gets us out of the third wave, and it's the vaccines that prevent the fourth wave. Um, that that are, is really the message. I think the message of hope, and it's really a personal one, is just that I, I truly think, you know, with the premier's goal of forty percent by the beginning of May, I think I think the Toronto Star is tracking that every day as well. I think we hit that threshold, and then if the vaccines ramp up. Uh, as promised in May, we should get a significantly more so that we'll be in a very different space by the uh, June, July timeframe uh, in terms of what our overall vaccination rates are in the province and what that means for the likelihood of, uh, you know, diminished risk for future waves and the ability to get back to my, back to a normal life. And, and that's what my kids ask me all, you know, and my wife asks me all the time and, That's my sort of message of, I guess, cheer and hope to them is that, I mean, I see the vaccines ramping up. They're, I think they're close to 30%, 28% of of, uh, eligible Ontarians. And with the goal of 40% in the early May timeframe, and then with the, uh, I think we'll be in a very different place um, through May because we're having ramped up uh, vaccine deliveries. So I guess it is, uh, we just need to hang on a little more. I tell that to the people at Orange because everyone is working hard and to you know, my family, to, to my friends, and I think to my colleagues uh, in the healthcare world. Finally, in terms of freedom, there's been some talk with the people who perhaps see as, you know, it's my body, I don't want to wear a mask. Like, and you've seen so much when you think about freedom, a lot of people think about what our countries have fought for, right? That's a big thing. Like 
in that messaging, you've seen so much. And whether it's at Sunnybrook, whether it's overseas, whether it's in Afghanistan, the idea that freedom to some people would mean like, oh, I don't want to wear a mask and I don't want to protect people. What is your message to them? Like in terms of getting over this vaccine and following those rules, like you have said. It's such a hard question because you're right. Uh, you know, so much has been sacrificed in the name of freedom uh, in different parts of the world. And it's such a, it's a such an important right. But it's always a bit of freedom versus responsibility. And I think, you know, our society, our country, our community, we're in, we're in crisis. And I think when you look at the... Um, I guess the toll on your personal freedom of wearing a mask is so trivial compared to, you know, the benefits societally about what it could mean for us, ICU, hospitalizations, family tragedies. I think uh, all I can say is I think the freedom to wear a mask, uh, to not to wear a mask is, is actually, it's a bit nonsensical when you consider how, how hard it is to overcome the, you know, the problems of the pandemic as a society and, and the burden on you for wearing a mask when you're outside is so trivial that, um, that I think it weighs very much heavily into that you should wear a mask and you should monitor these public health precautions. But, you know, I'm proud that we're in a country that respects freedom as well, because that's a hard fought, uh, hard fought right. For someone who really wants to get vaccinated, they're checking daily and maybe they're having ethical dilemmas. Like, should I even be taking one? I'm 18 or whatever. But where should people be looking? And, you know, what is the idea about getting the vaccine? Does it mean the vaccine, will will it bring us closer to the end? Is that something that we should all think about? And also, like, where should people look to keep getting these updates on where to get it? And should we all go together? Should we wait for other people, our parents first? So I think a lot of people have those questions that I think, again, it's about the communication piece, but even two to three points about single person choosing whether or not to get the vaccine and how they could find it. When it's your turn, I think you should absolutely uh, go get it and not wait for someone else. So if the age group is now 60 plus, even though your parents who are 80 plus are still thinking about which vaccine to get. I think if you're 60 plus and they've called for that, or if you're 50 plus and you're in a high risk area, I I don't think you should wait. I mean, that's a great Canadian trait to be so polite and say you first. But I think in this particular case, when your name is or your, your demographic is called, I think you should go get your vaccine. I think probably to start with, you'd start with um, the the Ontario site for vaccinations, and then you could look at the public health units as well. The pharmacies also have are advertising where they can get uh, your vaccine uh, booked as well. And again, I realize that that is, it wouldn't it be great if there were one site, just you hit that one site. Uh, unfortunately, this is where we're at right now, but I think for the for that amount of effort and maybe even asking for some help, I think it's well worth that amount of effort to get your vaccination, both for, for you personally, but also for us as a society. Thank you so much for joining us. And it was actually a pleasure to talk to you. So thank you so much. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Homer Tian, the head of Ontario's Vaccine Task Force. 